All right, folks, can we begin to take our seats? We're going to start the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take our seats and uh, close the doors to the uh, foyer, please. We'll just wait one minute more. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Steve Brower, and on behalf of the AHPBA, it's a consummate honor to uh, uh, introduce our first state-of-the-art lecturer. Uh, Dr. George Zagopoulos is uh, currently the Associate Professor, Dire Department of Surgery at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill. In addition, he's a scientist in the Research Institute in the Cancer Research Program, the Center for Translational Biology at the Research Institute at McGill University Health Center. Dr. Z Zagopoulos' uh, research focuses on elucidating the genetics of pancreatic cancer, investigating therapeutic sensitivities of subsets of pancreatic carcinoma. In addition, he's been instrumental in developing genetic and clinical screening strategies for individuals at high risk for pancreatic cancer. To that end, he's been the principal investigator of prospective clinic-based uh, registry, the Quebec Pancreas Cancer uh, Study, which involves both uh, biospecimen repository and uh, uh, preclinical mouse xenograft models for pancreatic carcinoma. This morning, George will be develop, uh, delivering his lecture entitled Point of Care Germline Testing for Pancreas Cancer and Surveillance at at -risk, of At-Risk Individuals for Pancreatic Carcinoma. Dr. Zygopoulos. Just press the center button. Thank you, Dr. Brower, for that generous and kind um, introduction. I'd also like to thank the HPBA and the program committee for this opportunity, the invitation to present today. I have no disclosures. So what I thought we would... Can we please close the doors?
Well, thank you, everyone. And once again, thank you to the HPBA for this generous invitation. What I thought we would do this morning is um, have, a, have a review of what is the um, current state of the art when it comes to germline testing for patients affected with pancreas cancer or newly diagnosed with pancreas cancer. I hope to convey to you the value of testing all of your newly diagnosed patients with pancreas cancer in your clinic um, for germline mutations. And then I would like to transition a little bit in the second half of the talk and discuss where are we at with screening recommendations for pancreas cancer, screening those at highest risk for pancreas cancer. Why don't we start with a um, simple question. How many of you routinely test your patients, provide germline testing to, for your patients that are newly diagnosed with pancreas cancer? That's question one. And then who orders the testing? Is it you, the surgeon, or your colleague, the oncologist, or both? Is it a genetic counselor that you've embedded into your clinics? Is it a physician extender? Or do you refer to medical genetics and let the medical genetic process uh, manage that? Or do you not routinely offer genetic testing? So if we could have the, those two polling questions up. So it looks like there's there are a number of folks that have routine germline genetic testing uh, offered to uh, their patients at their center or ac accessible, but there's still some centers that do not have a, a program or a process in place. So maybe we could move to the next question. And let's see who orders the genetic testing at your center. So this is quite encouraging. I'm seeing that surgeons and medical oncologists, those at the front line, those that, that see the patient at the initial consultation are ordering uh, the majority of tests. So that's, that's quite encouraging. So we'll move to the presentation. So at least over my lifetime in surgery and in medicine, uh, the focus to manage pancreas cancer or to try to advance uh, pancreas cancer treatments has been uh, on empiric approaches. And with the advent of molecular um, advances, next generation sequencing, and, and, and AI, uh, the shift has been to precision health. Initially, precision medicine and, med and oncology, and more recently into precision health. So if we're going to move the needle for pancreas cancer overall survival and really make a jump from 12% to something truly meaningful, 30, 40, maybe even 50%, we need to detect this disease early. We need to detect the precursor lesions and we need to intervene surgically. Early detection and prevention is part of precision, um, precision health. Screening for pancreas cancer, it is not feasible to screen the general population. This is not a very common disease. It's common to us. It will become the second leading cause of cancer death in this decade, but it is still a relatively uncommon disease. We don't have the proper biomarkers to help us for general population screening. And as you will see, the existing imaging techniques have limitations. However, given the tragedy of this disease that brings on to patients and their families, given how difficult it is to treat. Tr screening individuals at highest risk does have clinical equipoise. So who are these individuals? How could we identify them? And what is the effectiveness of surveillance? And that's really the focus of the rest of the talk. 
So these high-risk individuals are, 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 can be divided into two groups, those that have a hereditary form of, of uh, that may have may may get a hereditary form of pancreatic cancer, which which means they carry a germline mutation uh, that that leads to pancreatic cancer predisposition, among other cancers within the cancer spectrum of that uh, that that germline mutation carries, and then the familial pancreas cancer group, which is um, defined as families or kindred, where you see there's a clustering of pancreas cancer in that kindred but there is no identified mutation in one of the known genes that cause pancreas cancer. So together, this is not an insignificant group of, of patients. This represents um, about up to 20% of all patients that we see with a newly diagnosed uh, pancreas cancer will, will fall into one of these two groups. So how could we as surgeons help identify those individuals at risk? And I think we could do that quite easily in our clinics. So it's a low-hanging fruit. So if we just ask, get to that low-hanging fruit, we'll have an impact. So germline genetic testing should be offered to all newly diagnosed patients. And I think as surgeons, uh, we see many of those patients. We're often the, the front line in seeing these patients. So why should we do this? Well, I think there's, there, there are two there's action ability, the clinical action ability is twofold. One, therapeutic. For that patient in front of us, it may help how treatment decisions are, are made for them. It may act, give them access to therapies, and in the in, it may also um, help you decide which cocktail of a neoadjuvant form of chemotherapy you will offer the patient in the, in the event that they carry a BRCA2 mutation, for example. And then there's a huge impact on the patient's family, not only in prevention and early detection for pancreas cancer, but also for er pre prevention and risk reduction for other cancers associated in the, in, with these uh, genetic germline predisposition. And in fact, over the last number of years, the NCCN has recommended that all patients uh, with a new diagnosis of pancreas cancer have germline testing, but we have to do this in a way that we uh, get the results to the patients quickly. We, there has to be a, a balance between an hour long uh, gen medical genetics uh, consultation and moving the patients, the uh, cancer patients uh, care along. So one of the models has been to do this in the clinic, bring the germline genetic testing to the patient in the cancer clinic, um, whether it be a medical oncology clinic, or a uh, surgery, um, uh, surgical oncology clinic. So the way we did this in 2011, when I moved to Montreal, is we we started, you know, innovation and implementation of of, of something new is usually easier done uh, using research uh, resources. So we built a registry. We built the Quebec Pancreas Cancer Registry. It allowed us to bring. Um, resources to patients in the clinic, provide genetic testing for patients in the clinic, and at the same time, um, do everything Dr. Doyle was just talking about uh, in terms of transplant oncology, collect the biospecimens, make those mouse models, uh, bank, collaborate with other institutions, and so on. So Adeline Kuja did this um, over the last number of years, has been the genetic counselor that we've implemented in the clinic and has had an educational role for all of us, has taught the surgeons, the medical oncologists, how to counsel patients, counsel them briefly to the point and, and be able to order that point of care genetic testing in the uh, oncology clinics. We started off simple. Um, I did not have deep enough pockets to provide panel testing, next generation testing for, for all patients. So what we did is we uh, offered um, founder mutation testing. So in Quebec, we have a founder population because of how the Quebec population was established through immigration from France. So there are about 20 mutations that we could e easily sequence. We started off like that. And over the years, we continued uh, along the research path and implemented new research studies that brought more genetic testing. In 2019, we went to universal testing. Everybody got a panel. And last spring, the Provincial Health Authority finally agreed to have this covered and paid for by um, the uh, Provincial Health Plan. And our hospital has endorsed uh, allowing surgeons and oncologists uh, to order these tests themselves. So how did we do? 
pretty good. Most patients are interested. If you approach your patient, they'll be interested. At least in our uh, jurisdiction, our, our patients are interested. Nearly all patients will say yes to genetic testing. They'll say yes to even enrolling in the research program. Turnaround can be done quickly with current technologies. And as you can see, despite you know some of the referral biases to our program, the, the number of patients with actionable mutations is quite high. Where we have not done well is this cascade testing. So the patients will transmit the information to their first degree relatives. However, there's no mechanism in place for follow-up so that the first degree relatives can um, go ahead and have genetic testing and maybe be surveyed for pancreas cancer. And in fact, within our group, we've had patients that within the kindred that we have identified a mutation that go on and develop a pancreas cancer which perhaps we could have prevented if we did better at the cascade testing. So I will end this part of the talk by highlighting that germline mutations have really been the prototype for precision medicine or precision oncology in pancreas cancer. Who would have thought that we would have a New England Journal of Medicine paper based on precision oncology for pancreas cancer. This is, this, was, this is a study that was led by Talia Golan that shows the value of germline testing and identifying BRC1, BRC2, and we could extend this to PALB2 mutations in patients with advanced pancreas cancer who could have a pretty good quality of life being maintained on a laparib, a PARP inhibitor, rather than intravenous cytotoxic chemotherapy. So let's switch and let, let me ask you, how many of you offer surveillance or screening for pancreas cancer at your center to high-risk individuals? Maybe if we could go to the polling. So that is a lot better than I would have thought. Uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed that there are a number of centers across the country and, and uh, I would gather around the world that are offering uh, testing uh, for uh, surveillance for, for their patients. Let's move to the next slide. So what, what is the goal of surveillance? It really is to detect pancreas cancer early, uh, hopefully a stage one, stage 1A, where SEER data tell us that, you know, cure rates are greater than 80%, and to detect the high-grade precursor cystic lesions, perhaps. I apologize for the small writing on this slide, but who do we screen? And, and, and who are these high-risk individuals? Well, we, I gave you some broad categories, familial pancreas cancer, and, and germline mutations. This is from the CAPS uh, consortium, which is the largest consortium to date for pancreas cancer screening or surveillance. And what they recommend, uh, which is along the lines of the NCCN recommendations, is to screen those with, a, uh, all patients with Putzager starting in the early 30s, patients with CDKN2A mutations starting at 40, and patients that have a BRC2, BRC1, PALB2, ATM mutation, or a mutation in one of the mismatch repair genes, screen them, but only if there's a family history. And that, that is what most programs uh, do. In terms of familial pancreas cancer, we'd like to keep the definition of familial pancreas cancer uh, and have a family member that is a first degree relative. So if I was, if I came from a family that had familial pancreas cancer and my father passed away from uh, pancreas cancer, then I would be eligible for screening. But there are, it's an evolving field and the indications are evolving. This is from the uh, American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. And what this group suggests is that all patients with a BRC1 or 2 mutation be screened. It's not, there's logistical problems because that represents about 0.5% of the population. So it, uh, from, a, from a resource point of view, that doesn't seem feasible, at least in the Canadian healthcare jurisdiction. So how do we screen? Well, we tr hopefully take advantage of this lag time. So like colon cancer, we think pancreas cancer develops over a decade in a stepwise progression, starting from a KRAS mutation, eventually the tumor suppressors become inactivated and, and, and we get full-blown invasive cancer 
within a decade, maybe a little longer. That model is very, very favorable for, um, uh, for surveillance or screening. And the modalities that have been proposed, they're not perfect, they have their limitations, are endoscopic ultrasound and or MRI, MRCP on an annual basis. However, here's the problem. Not all pancreas cancer develops following this stepwise progression model. The accelerated model that was published uh, by a study led by Fayez Nota in 2016 shows that there could be a catastrophic event. So you start off with the KRAS mutation. That KRAS mutation sits there in, in that ductal cell and lingers around for a number of years. And then there's a catastrophic event. There is, there is shattering of the DNA called chromotrypsis. And essentially overnight, there's loss of all of these tumor suppressors and you have pancreas cancer that develops. So this accelerated model surveillance will fail and it's a question how many of the, how many pancreas cancers follow that model? What subsets of pancreas cancer, those germline mutation carriers follow, follow that model versus not? So what is the effectiveness of surveillance? What, do we have any data to tell us that we could do this effectively? So I was very nihilistic a decade ago and more re re recent studies have given me a lot more uh, optimism and I hopefully I could, I could sort of transmit that to you as well. So this is a study uh, that is uh, that shows about 10% of patients uh, in this cohort of nearly 400 patients were diagnosed with a um, a pancreas cancer. And what's what's important here, 10 of those of those 10 patients, six uh, went to resection, and um, and that that's encouraging because it shows that we could catch patients that are resectable, but it does also highlight that there's some patients that didn't go to resection because they were diagnosed with advanced disease. This study provided the most optimism. This is the Dutch study. Um, this is not the Dutch study. This is the another European study. The uh, prior was the Dutch study. This is CDKN2A, and you'll know this gene because it's mostly associated with familial melanoma. And what they saw here is that, again, 10% of patients what was really cool and interesting and motivating is that 83% of them had resectable disease and a third of that was stage one disease and the cure rate and, and an overall survival of 44%. So that provided optimism. Here's, here's um, the study led by um, in North America uh, out of Hopkins and which you could see here that in this study it was uh, presented where they divided patients that um, were diagnosed with pancreas cancer under surveillance using one of these surveillance exams, were diagnosed between the annual surveillance exams. And you could see the ones that were diagnosed during surveillance, not all, but by and large, most of them had good outcomes, had resectable disease. The ones that were in between surveillance presented with ad advanced disease, and those probably followed the accelerated model of pancreas cancer development. This is our study. Um, when I moved to Montreal, I, I had seen the experience in Toronto and I thought rather than doing every year, and I also wanted to sort of compare endoscopic ultrasound and an MRI, what we did is we, um, we, we alternated every six months between the two. Um, this, is, this is work that was summarized by Yifan Wang. And, and what, we, what we did here is our first 75 patients and the reason I wanted to put this out is uh, because we missed, I failed, I failed this patient. This is a patient that I followed for a number of years. She had a small IPMN in the unsented process, which I'm not sure uh, presents very well here. At a, at a, um, and, she and she was diagnosed with um, pancreas cancer between six month interval between an EUS and the subsequent scheduled MRI. Her son also had pancreas cancer, and um, he was managed by our colleagues in Toronto. We exchanged information, and and you know what we did, what Yifan did, is got their tumors and and we sequenced them, and we looked for evidence for chromotrypsis to see what accelerated model. They don't follow this accelerated model of chromotrypsis, but there's some accelerated model of cancer progression that these two patients followed. So there's there there was a. Because both of these uh, were thought to arise from IPMNs and the link of IPMN and cystic lesions with Putzhagers, we reviewed our two registries in Toronto and in Montreal and looked at 4,000 patients roughly. We found two additional uh, PJS-associated pancreas cancers. Both of them 
um, had rapid progression from normal um, MRIs to uh, or imaging to uh, metastatic or locally advanced cancers. And what's interesting, they, there was in both cases, there were cystic lesions by where the primary developed. We looked at the literature and we found from um, 12 studies, 62 patients with Sputzhagers, nine of these patients had surgical resections, all for IPMN indications. And what's quite interesting, seven out of the nine had cancers or high-grade malignant lesions, pre-malignant lesions. So in the general population, these patients with IPMNs uh, are common, relatively, 5%. We see them in our clinics every week. But what is true and is reproducible, study after study, is that there's a higher prevalence of side branch IPMNs or cystic lesions of the pancreas in high risk individuals, those individuals that have a higher risk of pancreas cancer. And that may reflect a field defect. So I follow them similar to how I follow my general population uh, IPMNs. And perhaps I'm not doing them uh, good justice and maybe our threshold to inter intervene surgically should be, should be lower. And, and this study highlights that point. About four years ago, we get, uh, Diane Simeone from NYU called us, called us to New York, and uh, we had we had a meeting, and we thought, and the idea was, what can we do? How could we build a consortium uh, to tackle pancreas cancer and really move that needle uh, from, at the time, less than ten percent to 30, 50 percent? We thought we tackle this uh, this concept of early detection, and this consortium called Proceed was put together. And, and as you could see over the last, it opened in 2020 um, and over the last few years, has it has expanded uh, significantly around the world. This is uh, on, on the right here. Um, you could see where we're at with enrollment. Our population target is 10,000 patients. Uh, that's what we would like to enroll over the next five years. Uh, we're at 1,700 plus, or we're that at 1,700 plus in November. Um, and that was, um, that's when we censored the data to um, try to get to you uh, the initial results. And 1,700 plus um, are patients in cohort one, and those are the patients at highest risk that we uh, require for them to undergo surveillance with MRI or endoscopic ultrasound uh, yearly. So in closing, this is my summary slide. Germline genetic testing, that should be routine clinical care. Um, every patient, I think there's enough clinical equipoise that every patient should have a germline genetic test. And I, and I think that that test should be done in the clinic uh, at or close to the initial consultation before the patient um, is, is, uh, moves along their cancer journey treatment path. And, and really, uh, this would, would drop in, in, in their priority of things, understandably. Care providers uh, requesting testing includes surgeons. And I was glad to see at the initial polling question that that is a true statement. If point of care is not available, then refer to medical genetics and advocate that the test returns quickly rather than a six to 12 month waiting period, which is the, issue, which is the challenge we have in, in, our, in our healthcare jurisdiction. For surveillance, I think there's a lot to learn and that should be done. Surveillance or screening for pancreas cancer should be, continue to be done in a research setting. Refer to a, if you identify an HRI, an individual at risk, refer to a research or a cancer center offering uh, uh, surveillance. If there isn't one in your region, perhaps a phone call conversation uh, would help. Sometimes, like we will enroll patients remotely and, 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 and co-follow the patients with, with a, with a uh, treating team uh, that's further away from Montreal. And then, I would say only initiate surveillance for pancreas cancer after uh, there's proper uh, counseling. These patients all get do meet with one of my genetic counselors, uh, part of the team, and then I do see them as well. And it's usually a 35 minute uh, interview with the counselors and so on before they, we uh, enroll them into surveillance. Finally, I would say that uh, in, in making a diagnosis of familial pancreas cancer in a kindred, 
um, it, it would be it's important that that kindred or uh, an affected individual in that kindred uh, undergo germline testing to make sure that there's not a germline mutation because although you could subject them to familial screening based on familial a familial pancreas cancer diagnosis it is important that if there's a germline mutation it's identified because there's a cancer spectrum with that germline mutation there's other cancer um, um, reducing strategies or the cancer risk reducing strategies uh, for other tumor sites that that those patients would benefit from so with that i thank you for your time Thank you, Dr. Zogopoulos. Uh, we have time for one or two brief questions. Great talk and fabulous work starting it from scratch, you know, and uh, so we do the same thing at Vanderbilt. We just started the program a couple of years ago and uh, the surgery team is leading the way in point of care testing. Two questions. There's a shortage of genetic counselors. So how do you deal with that issue? Because we can order the testing, but then they have to counsel the family and stuff in Canada or in your program. And then the second question is regarding variant of unknown significance. How do you survey those uh, patients? Yeah, th those are excellent questions. And, and I would say that the majority of patients will not need counseling. So there's a brief counseling. I mean, there's educational tools that could they could be counseled on. Um, I, th I think we could all learn how to counsel them for the initial testing. So patients with a positive result need families, need counseling, and those we refer to medical genetics and identify a family champion. Uh, sometimes the patient that was tested will be deceased, but we will identify a family champion and we'll go to those um, uh, those uh, follow-up um, interviews with medical genetics. VUS is, is, is a problem, um, and how to follow that, who takes responsibility of those tests, that's work in progress. Good morning again. Thank you for a great talk. I uh, wanted to give you a chance to expand on how to actually do surveillance. Certainly there's the SDK 11 population that you propose is a little bit higher risk, maybe a shorter interval. Then there's the completely their baseline screening MRI or CT shows nothing and they're a young, healthy patient, which is the majority of our BRCA2. Um, in our clinic, for the young, healthy, lower risk, totally benign screening, um, we do every other year uh, just to space out the interventions. But I'm curious if you can expand on how you manage your screening protocols and if you tailor them to the risk of their patients. Yeah, we do. We do tailor them as well. Um, I think once a year is what we keep to. Uh, in my program, we do not um, survey or screen or follow with imaging every year BRCA2 mutation carriers without a first degree or second degree relative that's affected. Uh, we will have a follow up phone call conversation. Uh, make sure that the family history hasn't changed. Um, we do offer them a baseline MRI if they're of, a, a, of age. Uh, so over 45 or 50, we will offer them. That takes a lot of anxiety out. I don't know what it means, uh, but if there's not a cyst, we, we let it be. And I think that's how most people go ahead. I think following every patient with the BRCA2 mutation annually, um, I think that's a lot of uh, healthcare resources. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, Providence, Los Angeles, Bobby Iqbalier. I wanted to find out if you can maybe comment on with the advent of using liquid biopsies and a lot of the CDDNA, we've been looking at our data using circular gene and about 30% of our pancreatic cancers actually on the somatic side are now found to have BRCA, whereas the germline didn't show anything. And obviously we can screen a lot of these folks from germline, we may or may not find something, we continue to do that. Um, will somatic testing play a part in this? And can you comment on that? Yeah, so I think um, somatic testing. So if we look at the cyst, I think, um, you know, I talk about the Putschager patients and the cyst, and maybe we should intervene surgically earlier. I think there are nice tests. Uh, one test as such is developed out of UPMC and just cyst fluid analysis to look at mutations beyond KRAS and, and sort of see if those are higher mutational risk, uh, you know, changes that are happening. So that's that's somatic. In terms of uh, circulating uh, uh, DNA or cell-free DNA, I think that's that's where the field should head. Um, if you're able to detect a second hit, a BRCA second hit uh, mutation, then that's that's great. The problem is we also, the, the imaging has to parallel. 
So if you have a high risk, uh, you know, biomarker in your blood sample and you can don't have a target in the pancreas or elsewhere, what do you do with that? I, I think I think those go hand in hand. Thank you. George, one last quick question. In the accelerated lesions, what are you actually seeing either at the genomic or histopathologic uh, uh, view of these? At the... Are there, are there distinct differences between the sporadic pancreatic ductal carcinomas? Um, the, the short answer is no. Um, unless they are driven by... The short answer is, for the most part, you'll have the same tumor suppressors, KRAS tumor suppressors being uh, mutated and 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 and, and lost, um, but it's not as clean as that. So BRCA two will follow a certain pattern; they will leave certain DNA damage hallmarks on on their genome. So they they will do that. If you look at the other one we didn't talk about, it's very therapeutic is, is um, those driven by um, Lynch syndrome. So uh, mismatch de deficient pancreas cancer is about 1%. So genomically, they're very different. The different tumor suppressors, they're more likely to be KRAS wild type. They're more likely to be basal-like uh, rather than classical and probably why they don't respond as well to immunotherapy as other uh, mismatch repair uh, cancers do. So there are some differences. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> on behalf of the AHPBA, we'd like to present you with this plaque commemorating your state-of-the-art lecture to Dr. George Sigopoulos, Miami Beach. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're following with the next state of the art lecture. <laughs>